committee will resume. Uh, when we left off, uh, Mr. Strickland uh, had testified, so we will begin with uh, members' questions. I'll begin. Uh, Mr. Strickland, in our first hearing on sudden unattended acceleration in Toyota vehicles, an automotive expert, Dr. Gilbert, who was mentioned a couple times today, testified before the committee about an experiment he had run on Toyota cars and trucks. Dr. Gilbert reported that he had been able to induce sudden unintended acceleration without having the vehicle's computers detect a problem. In briefings with committee staff, several academics and independent engineers have described Dr. Gilbert's work as sensible, reasonable, and legitimate starting point for an investigation into potential causes of sudden unintended acceleration. These academics, academics and engineers have discussed with the committee a variety of real-world events that could lead to this sort of resistive, um, to the sort of resistive Dr. Gilbert induced in, in his lab. But Toyota's response to Dr. Gilbert's testimony was not to investigate his work seriously. Instead, they aggressively attacked Dr. Gilbert's credibility and motives. It's my understanding that NHTSA has taken a different approach with Dr. Gilbert and has, in fact, invited him to its testing facility so that he can discuss his work with federal officials investigating sudden unattended acceleration in Toyota vehicles and cars. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. Uh, actually, um, uh, the engineers at NHTSA have been in, uh, in fairly regular conversation with Dr. Gilbert to a range of time, and it is my understanding that Dr. Gilbert will be visiting our facility in East Liberty, Ohio, for the next two weeks, where he will uh, be given access to our laboratory and our facilities to replicate his work, uh, to discuss with our engineers and also with the NASA folks as well. Um, this, um, his work, in addition to other experts, is very important for us to get to an answer, and we are welcoming Dr. Gilbert's uh, participation. Okay, well, you know, Toyota has described Dr. Gilbert's work as being phony, um, parlor trick, uh, words like that. Um, I expect you would not invite Dr. Gilbert to participate unless you thought he had some something to offer to this discussion. No, absolutely not. We believe that Dr. Gilbert has uh, created, has uh, replicated a situation where, uh, as you described, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, he could uh, have an incident of unintended acceleration without there being a Falco being put, picked up in the ECM. That is the core of everyone's question, and we have to take his work very seriously. In um, last time testified and uh, Secretary LaHood testified, uh, you were in the process of hiring engineers. Have NHTSA hired more engineers? We, we are right now in the process of recruiting several. Uh, we have our certifications out and we're beginning the interview process. We hope to get a number of folks across um, electrical engineering, software engineering, and um, other electronics issues on board very soon. Um, and the White House in this last week or two put out an initiative which they're trying to speed up, if you will, the, the hiring process. Yes, sir. Uh, from five months to about five weeks or mm -hmm. six weeks. Have you, you found that hiring process to be a burden in trying to obtain the expertise that you need in we are, NHTSA? We are in the process of executing through the quick hire process and the administration's reforms. Uh, we definitely appreciate these new reforms and we are uh, using them, um, them to uh, advantage and try to get folks on board as quickly as we can. The normal process does have um, uh, does require some energy and the reforms are very helpful. Let me ask you this. Uh, earlier this week, Toyota indicated it would uh, recall Lexus LS vehicles. Has there been a recall issued yet? They said it might be as early as tomorrow. My understanding, sir, is that Toyota will be issuing um, their uh, required documents to NHTSA on Friday. Uh, we so will, they haven't, they haven't officially announced a recall to NHTSA, but my understanding that will happen tomorrow. But they have informed NHTSA of the issue that arose in Japan and, and their plan of action. All right. The issue rose in Japan. Uh, I think there's about another. Uh, this is uh, their top line of the uh, LS uh, Lexus vehicles. Uh, those vehicles were also sold here in the United States, correct? That is correct. Have you worked with NHTSA on this recall? I mean, I'm sorry, have you worked with Toyota on this recall? No. Um, Toyota actually, uh, their work was with the Japanese uh, Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport, um, and through their work found that there was a defect regarding the steering mechanism. Once that was found, they reported to NHTSA about their plans in Japan and plan to take the same um, steps here in the United States, and we're working through the issues of the remedy, which we, I would imagine that will be announced on Friday. All right. Um, 
have you gone back through your database to see if there have been steering problems with these uh, Lexus LS? Absol yes, Mr. Chairman, we have. Um, uh, to explain a little more fully, the vehicle population involves the Lexus LS for the, I guess, end of the model year 2009 through 2010, which is a vehicle population of 3,800 vehicles here in the United States. Uh, the Office of Defects Investigation has gone, is going through and has gone through our database to see if there were similar uh, steering issues. Uh, we have not found a complaint as of yet, but we are continuing to search the database. Um, even absent that, uh, we appreciate Toyota's being forthright and taking action independent of our own work, uh, but we are looking to make sure that if we've had a similar issue. There were only 12 of these um, incidents in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, last hearing in February, when I, asked, I asked the question of all the witnesses, uh, but Mr. Lentz in particular, I, indicated that uh, the mats and the sticky pedal accounted to for about 16 percent of the unattended acceleration. Have you found, has NHTSA th through its investigation found any other cause for the other 84 percent of the un sudden unattended acceleration that remains unexplained? Uh, we are working through uh, several field investigations. We have 38 field investigations ongoing looking at the span of Toyota's unintended acceleration issues. We are leaving no theory on question or unturned. Uh, we have found no evidence of additional causes of the defect, but that does not mean we've stopped looking. We are going to turn over every stone, uh, not only our research ongoing with NASA and the uh, upcoming National Academy of Sciences study, but our work is also ongoing as to any other possible issues issues that could be creating this, uh, this fault. So we're no closer to resolving the unexplained 84 percent of the sudden unattended accelerations? That is correct, sir. Mr. Burgess, for questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Strickland, the uh, last hearing we had, the uh, Secretary LaHood said that Toyota was uh, had made some improvements and was going to be and then Toyota stated they had appointed a chief quality officer. Then we had the whole issue come up with the 2010 Lexus GS 460. So did that give you an ability to evaluate Toyota's responsiveness to, uh, to the problem with the Lexus as compared to their earlier responses? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Burgess, it has, and uh, and uh, I made a comment um, after uh, the Lexus uh, GX460 recall, the Consumer Reports recall with the electronic stability control issue. Uh, I have found since I've taken office in January that Toyota has been much more responsive and in, in, independent. I don't mean to interrupt, but my time's going to run yes, out sir. quickly. Did the quality officer make a difference then in, in that environment? Well, the quality officer, I, I was just informed of, of his hiring the change in the process. Um, the overall, the result is we have seen better responses. Toyota is working through the the the, uh, the organization issues, but these past two recalls have been because uh, I've been very happy with the responsiveness. Okay, one of the one of the issues with Professor Gilbert's testimony last time, one of the questions that he couldn't answer when I asked was how to give us a real world scenario of how that that situation that he described to us would exist. Would it be chafing of a cable holder? How would you get the correct amount of resistance placed across the two wires? And I never really got a straightforward answer to that. In what you have seen so far, uh, has is that a question that has been satisfactorily answered in your mind? What is the real world situation that would have to occur in order to meet the conditions that Dr. Gilbert outlined? Um, that's, I mean, I'll definitely have uh, my staff and my engineers get back to you uh, after the hearing for, uh, I guess, some more technical response. But we are inviting Dr. Gilbert out to East Liberty for him to replicate his test. So we haven't had an answer in terms of what would be the real world um, situation to create this fault. But that is something that we want to talk to Dr. Gilbert about and have him replicate. And will the NASA evaluate yes. that real world scenario also? Absolutely. And can this committee expect to see the results? of that evaluation. Yes, absolutely. All of the work will be made public and provided to the committee. Now, in addition to meeting with Dr. Gilbert, are you planning to meet with Exponent? Um, my understanding is the staff is going to be contacting Exponent. We've, um, and we'll be having conversations with every expert working in this area, uh, but we have not had a conversation with Exponent as of this point. Now, your contract with NASA states that it will provide all coordination with independent groups offering opinions on possible causes of unintended acceleration. Have uh, any of the independent groups asked to meet with NASA? 
Um, my understanding is that there's been a number, numerous conversations with experts around the country and universities. I'm happy to get back to you on the record about which conversations have happened and which ones are to be scheduled. Okay. Have, have, uh, has NHTSA or NASA refused any meetings with any particular groups? No, absolutely not. The, uh, and you, we, you will make that other information available to us? Absolutely, sir. Now, when we, and I don't have the data in front of me, unfortunately, any longer, but when you just looked at the timeline for the uh, uncommanded acceleration and the introduction of electronic throttle control, the two seem to be superimposed events that occurred about in, in 2002. Uh, but to the best of my understanding, they're really, through all of your work, there has not been a problem identified with the electronic throttle control other than the testimony we had from Professor Gilbert. So is that the, the only avenue that is of pursuit that is occurring right now? Well, um, we are looking at uh, the whole, the, the entire Toyota fleet and regarding this issue uh, through our field investigations. But in terms of have we found a defect regarding the electronic throttle control system from our past work, we have not at this point. But that's we are also the reason why we are investing so heavily into making sure that we have a full scope of the every answer. So that work is ongoing, continuing, but our past work hasn't shown a defect. Now, was my email correct that I alluded to about the Rhonda Smith car? Was Chairman Barton, Ranking Member Barton said, find the car and tear it apart and find out the problem. You, you did look and right now nothing remarkable. Is that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that still the answer? The that, respond, that, is the, that is still correct. Um, um, the Smith's vehicle is one of our test fleet. Uh, There's over 20 vehicles total. Uh, we have begun work on looking at her vehicle in addition to the rest of the fleet and we will be continuing work as part of our investigation with NASA. Now, when as I recall, Ms. Smith's testimony was very compelling when she gave it here in committee. Uh, one of her complaints, if you will, was that no one at Toyota would listen to her, but in fact no one at NHTSA would listen to her. Um, in light of what you have found with looking at the car, are you, uh, are you comfortable that NHTSA's previous evaluation of the vehicle shortly after the incident was as thorough as it needed to be and that the consumer's complaints were adequately addressed or should more care have been taken at the time that the, uh, the complaint actually occurred? I'm very confident of the work that Office of Defects Investigation did for the Smith vehicle. We deployed one of our best investigators, and it was a very extensive record of his work and his conversations. I've reviewed it, and I believe that everything that was, should have happened in that investigation was, did happen, and, um, and I'm very happy with the work. And that was, that was the work that occurred right after the incident? That is correct. Let me ask you this. Um, when Secretary LaHood was here, uh, I had I have a copy of the publicly available uh, NHTSA report on the, uh, on the inspection of a Lexus that was damaged in a catastrophic accident in San Diego, the Mark Saylor accident. There's a portion of the, of the report that's redacted, uh, paragraph five. Mm -hmm. I'd ask Secretary LaHood if I could, I don't need to have a copy in my hands, but I would like to look at the unredacted report. I'm willing to come down to the Department of Transportation or to your agency to, to make that review. I understand there may be sensitive information that the family would not want out in the public domain, but I do think it's important that members of this committee be able to review an unredacted report of this, ex of this accident. Uh, will you help me get that information that, uh, that I've asked Secretary LaHood to provide to me as a member of the committee? Uh, absolutely. I will definitely refer you to um, our Chief Counsel, Kevin Vincent. Uh, to, uh, I believe there's Privacy Act implications with that information, but anything that, if, as long as we are doing everything within the law and the provision of the information to the Congress, we will definitely assist you in that, in, in that regard. I, I would remind you the committee has subpoena power. I understand that. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. You back. You're over two minutes. Uh, Ms. Christensen, for questions, please. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mrs. Strickland, um, in your testimony, and it, uh, we've heard it from several members that Toyota paid sixteen million three hundred and seventy-five thousand in civil penalties, and in your testimony, you say that's the maximum penalty available under current law. Do you think that that's an adequate cap? Uh, no, ma'am. I believe that um, the size of the uh, uh, of the regulated um, manufacturers under NHTSA's regime is some of the largest um, uh, multinational corporations on the planet. And on occasion, I think a 16 
$1.5 million fine may not necessarily give the correct deterrent effect. Um, I've testified several times that I believe that the cap uh, should be significantly raised. Um, I know in the Motor Vehicle Safety Act of 2010, um, the committee uh, thought um, to uh, remove the cap and allow NHTSA the discretion to properly size a penalty. I believe that is a correct approach. Thank you. Um, you also um, say in your testimony that you haven't found a basis for opening up any new def defect investigations on unintend uh, unintended acceleration. What is the threshold? What would trigger uh, uh, a reopening of the investigation? Uh, well, the, the two investigations are ongoing in regards to timeliness. Uh, so what we're looking for is any document or indication that Toyota knew of a defect that posed an unreasonable risk to safety. And if they did not inform NHTSA within five business days of that discovery, they are in violation of the Safety Act and therefore we would take action. We are reviewing several hundred thousand documents in that regard. Um, when we have completed our review, if we have made a finding that there may be an issue regarding a violation of the timeliness um, um, uh, mandates of the Act, uh, we will take action once again. Um, but that is, we have made no conclusions as that the work is ongoing. Thank you. Uh, just one other question. Um, and as I recall in the last hearing, a lot of the decisions were being made in Japan, at the Toyota, uh, at Toyota in Japan. Uh, and in your testimony, you talk about meeting with the um, counterparts, your counterparts in the J Japanese government. So how do you, how would you assess their effectiveness, their independence, their commitment to strong oversight? Um, um, the Road Transport Bureau and the uh, Japanese Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and uh, Transportation is a very vigorous agency that has a very different approach and mandate under Japanese law. Uh, they are very committed to safety. They do have a different relationship with the manufacturers. It is, uh, it is uh, statutorily more collaborative than uh, the, uh, uh, how NHTSA's um, relationship is with the manufacturing, um, manufacturers here in the United States. However, they are uh, great public services, um, great engineers, and they do a, a, a solid job for the Japanese people in terms of making sure they uh, create a safe environment um, in terms of the handling of their vehicles. But we do have different approaches. But I have every confidence that our counterparts are just as involved and, and just as intent upon making sure that the fleet uh, that Toyota puts on the road is safe. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Mr. Burley, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome back, Administrator Strickland. Mr. Burley, thank you. Um, it's been a while since our last hearing on this topic where you testified, and I'm going to start with a little um, housework. Yes, sir. Um, since that last hearing, I've sent you three letters, one on March 3rd, one on April 22nd, and again last week on May 14th requesting information on complaints by Toyota owners who said they'd experienced sudden unanticipated acceleration even after their vehicles underwent recall service to modify pedals and replace floor mats. And in those letters, I also requested information about the steps NHTSA was taking to review Toyota electronics and ensure effective repairs in all affected vehicles. And to this date, I have yet to receive a response from you or your department. Can you give me some indication as to when I can expect a response to those inquiries? Monday or Tuesday. If it's Tuesday, you'll get it very early Tuesday. Right. Uh, Mr. Braley, it is my responsibility to make sure that you, any member of this committee or any member of the Congress gets a timely response. It is my responsibility that it happens. I apologize that you have not received that response. I will make sure that it happens immediately and on a foregoing basis that you get a timely response. Thank you. I appreciate that. Do you have a sense as you sit here today how many reports NHTSA has received of sudden and anticipated acceleration in previously serviced Toyota vehicles? Um, I, we have had a number of reports, especially um, within, um, I guess, within uh, the February, March timeframe period after repairs were executed. Um, we have uh, conducted numerous um, interviews 
and, 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 and done field investigations. I'll definitely get back to you on the record with a specific number. Um, I do know for a fact that the number of those um, remedy repairs uh, complaints have markedly decreased um, since March. Uh, I know that our staff has worked very closely with Toyota and informed them of our findings. There were some issues with how the dealers were applying repairs um, that, and I know that Toyota made, upon our request, made several modifications to the instructions to the dealers on how they apply the remedies, and we have seen a, num a marked decrease in the complaints. But we are continuing to making sure that the remedy um, is properly applied and any consumer that is still having issues that we follow up. Are those complaints on previously serviced vehicles being forwarded to the entities such as um, Exponent or the NASA investigators who are looking into the potential link between an electronic problem and the issue of sudden anticipated acceleration? I can speak to Exponent getting direct access to our work or our data upon request. I mean, they were, they were positioned as any private citizen in terms of a FOIA request or anything of that nature. We are not collaborating with Exponent. Um, NASA is getting everything that we have in regards to our work on sudden unattended acceleration, including those remedy repair issues, and in addition to all documents from Toyota. So we are, NASA is getting those documents. I don't know if Exponent has made a request of that. Now, have you been provided with copies of the materials that Exponent has submitted to the committee in response for requests for information about their work product in connection with this investigation? I have not, Mr. Braley, but I've been made aware of some of the responses uh, by my staff. Were you aware that the committee has been provided with a report from Exponent that is titled Evaluation of Gilbert Demonstration? Yes, I am aware of it, sir. And that we've also been provided with a PowerPoint presentation with a similar title, Evaluation of Dr. Gilbert's Demonstration? Yes, sir. I'm aware of it. Have you seen any other reports in, any, in either a preliminary, a draft, or a final form from Exponent detailing its work analyzing the potential problem of sudden unanticipated acceleration in Toyota vehicles? No, sir. I have not. Were you aware that Exponent has billed approximately 11,000 hours of work since the beginning of this year on this particular investigation? I was not aware of that, but that is a significant amount of work. And because it is a significant amount of work, do you find it at all surprising or disturbing that the documents we have received to date from Exponent are limited specifically to the testimony of one witness who testified at our previous hearing on February 23rd. That would not be NHTSA's approach if what our work plan and our work would be incredibly detailed and aspecting every um, minute of what we do. Uh, I would have imagined that the committee would have the expectation, the same expectation of exponent, the fact that you do not have it, I would imagine it being very troubling to the committee. All right, thank you very much, I yield back. And Mr. Waxman, for questions, please, sir. Uh, yes, Mr. Strickland, uh, just following up on that line of questioning, do you believe it's possible to conduct solid engineering work if you don't have a written plan for the research, you don't keep a, rec a written record of the work, which is apparently the situation with Exponent? Um, it will be my expectation of NHTSA, NHTSA's engineers, that we have a proper workflow plan and engineering analysis. Everything should be properly documented. and. Also, in terms of our work with NASA, we have to be prepared for a peer review uh, to be conducted by our Volpe Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So uh, that would be an incredibly different tact how we would um, execute a uh, research plan. Uh, so I would say that that would not be my expectation if I was um, uh, dealing with it on the private sector. Uh, we've learned that Toyota's Defense Council controls Exponent's work. They review everything that Exponent does and they have the right to prevent Exponent from releasing unfavorable results. Does this concern you? Or Toyota is relying on Exponent to do its research, and Exponent is being directed by Toyota's Defense Council. Is this uh, the, the, the way you think an investigation uh, ought to be handled? Well, there's, there's two components to, I mean, not to speak for Toyota, they can clearly speak for They're themselves. They're going to speak for themselves um, soon. But there is, you know, preparation for a litigation, 
and then there's also uh, a scientific investigation into a cause of a problem. And those uh, could be mutually exclusive. Perhaps an exponent may be doing that additional work uh, to deal with answering the question. But from what I have understood, all the work has been in preparation for litigation, but it is not um, a scientific analysis or dealing with a hypothesis of a problem. Um, so I would say that at this point they have not uh, fulfilled I, it's part of the I guess the, the the solution in terms of trying to find the answer from what you've just described. Uh, brake override is a vehicle software technology that many auto safety experts say would address the sudden uh, unintended acceleration. With brake override if a driver applies both the accelerator and the brake at the same time in most situations the car will disregard the accelerator and apply the brake I understand that NHTSA is currently evaluating the brake override technology and is considering updating its standards to require the technology in all cars. Do you consider brake override to be a safety feature? We believe at NHTSA that safety and that brake override has huge implications for safety. Um, it is something that we believe has great promise. We are doing our research uh, and we do anticipate that um, it could have a great value to implementation in the fleet, but we have to do our work preliminarily. But yes, we consider it a safety feature. Uh, we've been told that in the course of discussing complaints of the uh, sudden un unintended acceleration with Toyota, NHTSA suggested to Toyota that Toyota retrofit some of its models with this brake override. Toyota advised the committee that it has decided to make brake override a standard feature in all of its cars for the 2011 model year forward. Toyota also told us it will upgrade the software in certain earlier models during service for other recalls. Uh, Mr. Strickland, after 2011, when Toyota is done with its retrofitting, will there be Toyotas on the road will not have the brake override? I would imagine from your that will not have brake override. Do you support making brake override a mandatory feature for all cars in future model years? As I said, we at NHTSA, we are beginning our research to justify that such a move, but uh, in a preliminary fashion, the one thing, the one goal we want to have is this. Any driver that depresses the brake should be able to stop the car. Yeah. And, that, and with that goal, we believe that has great promise. Yeah. Well, uh, Toyota's reached a conclusion that they want to have this brake override. They think it's important. Is there any reason why if they've decided a brake override is important for the future cars and some of the existing cars that they wouldn't want to make brake override available in all cars that are compatible with this feature? I'll ask them that myself, a, but can you imagine any reason they would not want to do that? From a, from a consumer standpoint, I would imagine that every driver of a Toyota that may have an issue regarding sudden unattended acceleration would like to have this feature on their car. Speaking as a you know as a just speaking as a consumer, uh, Toyota's decision making in terms of how they implement it um, is an ongoing question. But mm -hmm. to answer your question, sir, I believe that it would be a, a positive move for safety and for their for their own driving public. Well, I, I'm going to look forward to hearing Mr. Lentz's explanation explanation for why it won't be available in all Toyotas, because uh, I don't see a reason not to make it all available, make it available in all the Toyotas, but we'll get his response to that. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Ms. Schakowsky, questions, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Toyota relies on two primary justifications for its assertion that electronics plays no role in sudden unintended acceleration. We've already discussed one of the shortcomings, uh, one of the justifications, the work the engineering firm Exponent has done for Toyota and the problems with that. The other justification Toyota relies on is the pre-market testing that Toyota's own engineers do before manufacturing vehicles for sale to the public. Our committee staff conducted a transcribed interview of two Toyota engineers from Japan and asked them multiple questions about the company's testing protocols. We learned that this pre-market testing has significant limitations. Toyota only conducts these, this test during the design phase of the vehicles. As one of the Toyota engineers we interviewed told the committee, uh, quote, once, uh, once, quote, mass production is initiated then that means that the design is completed so we don't conduct anything additional, unquote. So, Mr. Strickland, does this pre-market testing strike you as adequate to identify a cause of sudden unintended acceleration? Well, uh, 
Representative Schakowsky, there's, uh, there's sort of, there's two components here that NHTSA is concerned about. It's compliance. Before a vehicle is put into the stream of commerce, it has to be uh, compliant with all the federal motor vehicle safety standards. And that's one set of issues that has to be taken care of. The second part, after the vehicle's on the road, we worry about any defects ex post. Um, pre -market I, I understand what you're saying, but now we're talking about before. But this is before mass production. Let, let me let me go go on. Mm -hmm. um, Toyota engineers also told us that Toyota does not perform these design phase tests on a large number of vehicles, mm -hmm. and as a result, its samples may not be representative enough to test for the risk of a rare event such as a sudden unintended acceleration. Some of the tests that Toyota relied on for its claim that the electronic system has uh, had undergone quote, extensive testing, unquote, involves sample sizes of just one or two vehicles. So, Mr. Strickland, does Toyota's approach strike you as adequate? The approach, um, every manufacturer has a different approach. Uh, the only thing what we are concerned about is what happens on the road. If no, I understand, but you said that there was a pre-market phase. Mm -hmm. that you required is the test of one or two cars in the de design phase, in your view, sufficient? I would have to compare that with other manufacturers' testing protocols, and I don't have that on, okay. at hand, but I will definitely get back to you on the record. Okay. Furthermore, we, uh, well, let's see. Um, sudden unintended acceleration occurs rarely and intermittently. Do Toyota's tests involving, oh, I asked you that, one or two vehicles, okay. Furthermore, we learned that fail-safe mechanisms in Toyota vehicles are designed to detect single point, single event faults. In other words, faults that occur in isolation mm -hmm. and affect only one vehicle component. Toyota's testing of critical components of the electronic throttle control system reflects this focus in that they do not test for multiple event or multiple component faults. Numerous academics and independent experts told committee staff that rare multiple event faults could play a role in sudden unintended acceleration. It seems to me that Toyota should try to identify all potential faults, not just the most frequent ones, and develop tests to prevent them. So, Mr. Strickland, do you agree that to Toyota should take a comprehensive approach for, to test for prevent potential causes of sudden unintended acceleration? They should take a comprehensive approach. NHTSA's work with NASA is going to be a multiple fault causation study, which takes into account possible multiple intervening events which could cause this. That is our study. That is our approach. And we would have the expectation from our findings that if we do find a vehicle defect, that that will be part of our response to Toyota if that's the case. But NHTSA's approach is a multi-causal analysis in how we can replicate that fault. Based on the description of Toyota's pre-market testing that you've heard today, do you believe Toyota's pre-market testing provides a sufficient basis to conclude that there are no potential electronic causes of sudden unintended acceleration? I don't think you can use a pre-market analysis as a determinative factor that there is no problem. I think you have to not only do pre-market testing, but you have to do long-term, um, you know, I guess uh, long-term studies of how your vehicle reacts, you know, in the real world, as number of manufacturers do. So I don't think that uh, I, that NHTSA would say that a pre-market test um, validates a long-term answer of impossibility of there being a failure. Well, I'm concerned about the pre-market testing itself, and it seems that Toyota's is not an adequate substitute for thorough testing needed to identify potential defects after manufacturing is complete, and it's time for Toyota to stop making public assurances about the infallibility of their electronic systems when they don't have comprehensive testing to back it up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Strickland, if I may, a couple questions. Would you give Mr. Strickland documents? Uh, in response to some of the questions from Mr. Burgess and uh, Chairman Waxman, a couple questions. First one is a letter dated February 22, 2010, uh, sent to uh, Secretary LaHood by myself and Mr. Uh, Waxman. Mm -hmm. And on page 4, subpart B, asks that uh, NHTSA reopen its uh, investigation of PE, that's prim preliminary examination, right? 04021, mm -hmm. um, which had 37 consumer complaints on sudden unattended accelerations in the uh, Camry, 2002-2003 uh, Camry, uh, Solera, and Lexus. 
Um, we've yet to have response. Are you going to reopen that investigation as requested? The, the, the universe of test vehicles subsumes these, um, subsumes these all of these uh, cars that you asked for. So in terms of a defect investigation, as part of the NASA, the NASA study that's ongoing uh, that we'll have, be, have done in the, uh, by the end of the summer. So, so to answer the short answer to your question is we are reevaluating all this work in light of the NASA study. In addition to that's going to be included in the NAS study, but we will definitely uh, get back to you on the record and direct response to subpart B. Okay, well, if we're looking at that, and in response to Mr. Waxman's question, you said this brake override system is a huge safety issue. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't NHTSA require Toyota then to have the brake override system in 2002? In 2003, Lexus ES 300s, the Toyota Camry, and the Toyota Camry Solera from 2002 2003, since we had at least 37 consumer complaints, and we've asked that it be reinvestigated. Well, why wouldn't you require the brake override system be put in all uh, vehicles or Toyota models of vehicles that have this sudden unattended acceleration that we have unexplained answers for? It is still an ongoing investigation, Mr. Stupak. Um, if we make a finding that it is a vehicle defect based upon that, then yes, we would, as part of a mandatory recall of those vehicles, we would ask for a remedy and that and brake override could be a mandated part of that remedy. Because it is an investigation that is ongoing, which is inclusive and the key to the NASA study, we are not in a position to, uh, well, to make that demand at this Time. If Toyota is putting it in some of the vehicles now, and it'll be in all vehicles in 2011, mm -hmm. then by putting it in certain vehicles now, is that admission then that you have a uh, defect in those models and that's why you got put in this brake override? That isn't an admission. That is some that is a decision that Toyota made independently uh, for whatever reason and you can have ask Mr. Lynch those questions. But the from NHTSA's perspective, we can only force a mandatory recall if we believe that there is a, a, a defect that we can prove in court and we haven't been able to do that yet. Uh, but the fact that Toyota feels that they need to install this in some vehicles vehicles uh, may be indicative of what they feel is to be a proper solution until they can come to their own answers. All right. I guess I'll save those questions for Mr. Lenz. Let me ask you the other document I put before you. It's uh, dated 5-2-2007. Um, it's a memorandum from Scott Yon, and this is on the Smith vehicle that Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Burgess had asked about. In the last paragraph, first line, it says, discoloration, rust, and surface damage to brake rotors is visible through all four wheel apertures. And if you go on, next page, uh, second paragraph, lower part of that paragraph, it indicates the brake components exhibit wear and damage inconsistent with normal operation and inconsistent with the indicated vehicle mileage. Then they have a number of photographs which show that Damage indicates excessive brake temperatures is consistent with the brakes being applied vigorously over an extended period while the vehicle is moving at speed. So the Smith vehicle, well, maybe every time you turn the key, you don't find a sudden unattended acceleration. Uh, obviously, there was some damage there that was outside the normal wear and tear on a vehicle of this age. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. And you've never found any vehicles that's been considered to have SUA sudden unattended acceleration. Uh, you haven't been able to turn the keys. You said you had 20 models and you haven't found this sudden unattended acceleration. We have not had a, uh, a, uh, an event where we had turned on the, where the engineer turned on the car, was able to replicate the fault uh, specifically because of um, something outside of the parameters of a floor mat entrapment issue. And we don't know when that occurs. That's why we give it this name, sudden unattended acceleration. There is, yes, absolutely. We basically have to categorize all of those events. Um, there could be multiple causes for that, and that's the reason why we are having our long-term investigation for uh, the National Academy of Sciences and having NASA specifically look at Toyota's electronic throttle control system uh, for the study that we are uh, accomplishing and will finish um, at the end of the summer. Okay. My time is up, Mr. Burgess, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the, uh, Mr. Strickland, on the order of the, uh, of the break override that now is receiving so much attention, um, you mentioned, I think, that installing it, the break override in Toyotas would be a, a positive move. Is that cor correctly state your feelings? Yes, sir. I think it would be a very positive move. What uh, what other manufacturers have installed a, a, a brake override system on, on their car, cars? There are several manufacturers that have brake override systems. Are there um, some that don't? 
Uh, there, there are some that don't. And why is that not a requirement if you think it would be a good move for Toyota? Would it be a good move for other manufacturers? Uh, we believe that brake override has a tremendous amount of promise, which is the reason why we are undertaking our preliminary research for possible rulemaking. Um, in terms of dealing with this issue, uh, I guess, uh, across the rest of the fleet, that's going to be part of the study and part of the um, one of the answers will be possible long-term solutions either uh, from the National Academy of Sciences, which may include Rough, uh, rough, rough numbers. What percentage of the fleet has the break override right now? Um, uh, that I'm not sure I have to get back to you on the record for that. Okay. It, but why isn't it more widely used? What are the barriers to to the implementation? There's, well, there's different there's different systems in terms of how the brake and the accelerator work in terms of their software configuration, their mechanical linkages. I'm sure every manufacturer has different strategies in in manufacturing construction, but, which may lead to different decisions. I don't want to oversimplify, but if you're thinking about rulemaking, then presumably you're looking at cars with electronic throttle control would have would would have a requirement for a brake override system so that if if the brake is applied the throttle the default is for the throttle to stop action yes sir we are absolutely looking at that and, and so that if that's good for toyota then it's good for x percent of the fleet that does not have the brake override system. The goal for all regulations promulgated by NHTSA is for the safety of the entire fleet, not one manufacturer. When we had the other hearing, and I don't have the information in front of me today, but it was a list, uh, rated a numerical list, of uh, complaints received by the, your agency mm -hmm. about cars. And Toyota showed up on the list, but they were like, I don't remember, 16, 17, 18 on the list. That means there were 16 other but car manufacturers where the cars had more complaints uh, than Toyota, and, and yet here we are involved in, in, in a series of hearings over Toyota. Have you looked at the cars and the complaints that s scored higher than Toyota or worse than Toyota, if you will, on, on that list? And are we, uh, are we actively pursuing the, the complaints that came into NHTSA for those vehicles as well? Um, NHTSA looks at all trends across all manufacturers. Uh, in terms of how the focus on Toyota, there was clearly an anomaly in acceleration events but during, during the period that we're talking about, which is the reason why NHTSA has opened, you know, up until this point, we had, I believe, we opened um, eight investigations into this issue uh, prior to uh, the Santee crash. So. Uh, we have not taken a look at, we've treated Toyota as we would treat any manufacturer. Yes, there are other manufacturers with com similar complaints, more complaints. Uh, we look at them um, in just as vigorously as we do Toyota. It's just that in terms of the actual profile and in terms of trend analysis, Toyota in this area did have a higher tendency uh, towards, uh, towards the later years of the Camry run from after 2002. And was that all related to models that had the electronic throttle control? Yes, sir. Let me ask you this. Let's talk about NASA for just a minute before I run out of time. Uh, and you referred to the research plan. Um, has, uh, have you submitted a research plan to, uh, for, for NASA's work? That is, we are, we are actually, we will be meeting with NASA next week. Uh, it required a, a, a huge amount of work to get the Toyota source code. There's lots of proprietary issues we had to overcome. There's been a tremendous amount of documents that NASA had to receive. Um, in addition to our automotive experts working with NASA, uh, so we, our hope is to have a uh, test plan done fairly soon, and hopefully we'll be submitting, once we get that finalized, we'll submit it to the Volpe Center for peer review. But we have not finished our plan yet. Uh, so you'll submit this fault train analysis also for evaluation by this committee when you have it in hand? Absolutely. The um, timeline on the NASA review is for it to be completed by the end of August? That is our, that is our hope. And we don't have a plan yet, but we're going to get one. Is that correct? Yes, you will get this. So what if, what if we get to the end of August and we haven't gotten there? What, what happens then? Well, we have a timeline and a goal to make sure that we have results, but, you know, Mr. Burgess, the, the primary objective is to make sure that we get it right. So if it requires, but there are some um, issues that may require to take us more time, we'll update the committee about those issues as they arise, but our hope is to be done by the end of the summer. Have you got enough funding to do what you need to do? Because we, after all, have not done a budget this year. We're not going to do any appropriations till late in the year. 
are you going to be able to pay for the things that you need to do to get this information? We are, at the time, we are properly resourced right now. If there is any resource issues that uh, confront us in our work, we will definitely come back to the Congress and inform them. Let the record show that NHTSA is a wash in cash and needs no more money. I think that's what he just said. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, Mr. Burgess, but thank you for the implication. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Burgess. Uh, Ms. Christensen, any questions? Mr. Braley, any further follow-up questions? Mr. Braley. Uh, Administrator Strickland, one of the things I'm curious about is the work that your agency is doing looking at other types of analysis that are being done by manufacturers in other parts of the world, looking into the problem of evaluating electronic throttle control systems. Are you aware of any of the work that's being done by the European manufacturers in terms of education and training to analyze potential problems with those systems? Um, Mr. Burley, I am not, but I am certain that my staff is I'm more than happy to have them come and speak to you and your staff and get back to you on the record on any questions regarding the differences on approaches between the European Union or the Japanese or, uh, or, the, um, or any other manufacturer. Be happy to do that and would also encourage your staff as part of its work on the investigation of this specific problem to look at what's happening with those other manufacturers, what lessons they have learned and what their safety record is on the issue of sudden unintended acceleration after those programs have been implemented. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> one of the other questions I wanted to ask you about is throughout this process, Toyota has represented to the committee that it retained exponent to conduct an independent investigation of the underlying causes related to these problems with sudden unintended acceleration. You've been here when we've talked about that. Yes, sir. And they've made similar representations to you. That is correct. Now, the company that they have retained to do that analysis, Exponent, do you know much about them and what they do? I am fairly familiar with uh, uh, the company and, um, and, its, and its prior name and, and the issues that it's worked on over the years. Its prior name being Failure Analysis Associates. That is correct. Are you aware of any instance where Failure Analysis Associates or Exponent has been retained to do an independent analysis on behalf of a consumer who was injured in a defective automobile? Um, my recollection of exponent or failure analysis work probably goes back to 1993. Uh, so that's the window that I have knowledge of. I am not aware of them doing work uh, for an injured consumer or a victim of a product. Of all right, product. thank you. Those are all the questions I have. Well, that concludes the questions for this witness. Uh, administrator, thank you. Uh, for the record, I'd like to enter into uh, the record the two documents I'd present to the administrator on questions of February 22nd 2010 letter from uh, Chairman Waxman and myself to the Secretary LaHood, and also the memorandum dated uh, May 2, 2007, concerning the Smith vehicle that we asked questions of. So, without objection, they'll be entered in the record. Thank you, and Ms. Strickland, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lentz, thanks for being here. You're on our second panel. Uh, we have James E. Lentz, who is the